Y'all ready to get into it? Yes. How many of you have ever had an argument with the Holy Spirit? How many of you ever won that argument? Yeah, I'm having an argument with the Holy Spirit this week over this message. Uh, because uh, quite honestly, and I, I, don't, I don't mean this to sound arrogant, but when he told me what I needed to speak on, I said, you know, this group is deeper than that. This group doesn't need something that simple. We need to go deeper. Uh, and yesterday, during our prayer time here this morning, uh, I was asking him again about it, and he said, listen, your church is going to need this message. You're going to need this message. Now, that made me very excited in light of what the message is about. Uh, but uh, on Wednesday night, I asked people in the congregation who had been healed, either physically or emotionally, who had been healed while they were at Revived Church. About 50, 60 people raised their hand. And so we grabbed a microphone and we got testimonies from about 15 or 20 of those people, everything from being set free from anxiety to healings and in, in dysfunctions in their hand, pains in their back, all kind of healing went on. Uh, and so one thing that seems to happen whenever churches talk about healings is skepticism. Skepticism. I think it's kind of in our nature that people will stop and say, I wonder if they really got healed? Uh, maybe the question this morning is, are you a skeptical person? You know, uh, those people say that happened, but I wonder if there's any real proof because when they can provide proof, then I can believe in it. But if, but if not, you know, I'm just wondering if maybe they're a person that needs a little extra attention and they get extra attention by saying they got healed. I mean, what about when it comes to anything miraculous? You know, if, if you're going to tell me something miraculous happened, well, you're going to have to have proof, Todd. You know, a lot of people say things happen, but when you really dig down into it, I'm not so sure it actually did. Let me set up a scenario, and we'll see how honest we can be with ourselves. If someone were to say that during a service here, I got healed from diabetes... What are the first thoughts that come to your mind? See, because I think some people will think, well, did they also just happen to change their diet prior to that? Did they test their sugar to know they got healed or did they just say they got healed? Hey, did they really have diabetes? Are they just claiming they had diabetes because they had this high blood sugar count one time? In other words, what kind of diabetes did they actually have? And can we see their test results before and their test results after? And then the big hammer. I wonder if there's an actual doctor who can confirm this. I love that one. See what I mean? Sometimes our first thoughts about the miraculous that happens are doubt. And then we want some kind of proof, as if we get the proof, then we could believe. But we're not sure they actually had the problem and actually got healed. So it's kind of a weird place to be in as a believer, because we actually want to believe in the miraculous. We actually want to know that Christ could heal today, that things could miraculously come about. But then when it happens, the first thing we do is we get a little bit skeptical. And here's why I think I'm speaking on this this morning. Because that skepticism can lead to a missed revival. That doubt can lead to a missed opportunity to see a great move of God because our faith wasn't where it needs to be. And I want to show you an example of that happening in John chapter 9. So if you've got a Bible, we're going to go through the entire chapter of John chapter 9, verse by verse, all the way through. I don't think I even have any other supporting scriptures. We're just going to stay in that chapter. So pull out your phone, pull out your Bible, go to John chapter 9. We're going verse by verse. Are you ready? Yes. As he, Jesus, passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. Everybody say blind from birth. 
And the disciples ask him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? See, that born blind is an important part of this story. Why? Because they're following a scripture out of Exodus chapter 20, verse 6, uh, where God says, don't make any idols or worship because I'm a jealous God and I'll be visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation and everybody forgets to read the rest, of those who hate me. It's interesting that they would apply it to the family of God. Interesting. But they're saying, since he was born blind, then there must be a sin of his parents. Now watch Jesus' answer. Jesus answered and said, it was neither this man who sinned, nor his parents but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Now watch this. We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now I want to I show you three things in that scripture. Jesus says, in this case, nobody sinned. He was set up to be known for all of history as the guy that Jesus stopped and healed. My question, can you handle being that person for Jesus? Born blind for years, begging blind, so that one day Christ could come and heal you and make a public display for the glory of God. Secondly, Jesus says, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Here's my question for you this morning. Is Jesus still the light of the world? Okay, therefore, he must still be in the world because it was an and statement. He said, I am the light of the world. I am uh, in the world. So it's daytime now because Jesus is in the world. And we know this scripture, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in in me. So the light of the world is still here and there is still work to be done. But look at the beginning of verse four. Did you notice he said, we must do the works of him who sent me. Not I, Jesus must do the works of the father, but we must do the works of the father who sent me. See people who believe that healing no longer exists. Let me give you a, um, a seminary theological class for a moment. Here's the problem with the majority of believers that don't believe in miraculous healing today. It's a word called dispensationalism. Dispensationalism means for a certain dispensation of time, something was true, but after that time, it's not true. And I'll give you examples of dispensations in the Bible. There was an Abrahamic dispensation. It was the dispensation before the law. God had made promises to Abraham, said, have your people be circumcised. This will be a sign that I'm in covenant relationship with you. But when Moses comes along, he releases a law in writing on tablets and then in a misfile. And there was a mosaic dispensation that said, now this is how we commune with God as opposed to how we did by faith through righteousness under Abraham. We have the law put in place. So there was a mosaic. And then there was the one called the church or grace that's the new covenant that we're under now. And so we operate not under the law. Why? Because a new dispensation came along called the new covenant. So now we operate under grace. Are you with me? Okay, so what happens is the majority of people that teach that there's no miraculous healing today have created another dispensation within a dispensation. It's called the apostolic dispensation. And what they say is because there were apostles who were performing miracles, when the apostles died off, there are no more miracles. Therefore, we're under a different dispensation. Now, here's my question. If I'm not under the same dispensation that the apostles were under, where's the definition of the new dispensation that I'm under? 
Because one has to end and another has to begin. And when the apostles died, nothing ended. There were people after the apostles who were performing miracles. There were people in scripture that were not apostles that were performing miracles. So there is no apostolic dispensation. There were simply apostles in the new age dispensation. Are you with me? Isn't it interesting that to the church, Jesus gives apostles teachers, pastors, evangelists, and prophets. Those things didn't go away because the apostles are not here. They're still involved in the church today. We are still in the dispensation of the new covenant, the church age, under grace, and the miraculous is still happening. Mm, 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 mm. Look at verse six. (laughs) I'm about to flip the whole thing over. When he had said this, Jesus... He spat on the ground and he made clay of that spittle and he applied the clays to the eyes. He applied the clay to his eyes. Isn't that an awesome picture of Jesus that we have? I can't tell you how many churches I've been in. I've been through all of their children's area and I've never seen that image of Jesus spitting on the ground in a picture. I've looked through Bibles and the opening pictures of the Bibles, and I never see that one of Jesus hawking a loogie. (laughs) You notice it says he didn't pick up the spit or pick up the dirt and spit in his hand. It says he actually spit on the ground. And he says to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. And he went away. Everybody say went away. That's going to be important. So he went away and washed and came back seeing. Jesus sees a man who is blind, makes this clay in the mud, puts it in his eye, and then tells him to do something. Go to this particular pool and wash this mud off. Listen to me. Obedience comes before the miraculous. Obedience comes before the miraculous. What happens for most of us today is we want the miraculous to come in order for us to be obedient. How many of you have said, God, if you will take care of this, I will do this. If you will take care of this bill, if you will fix my marriage, if you will heal my child, I will commit myself to obey. See, here's the problem with that mentality. You could have had it all along if you would just have obeyed. Obedience precedes the miraculous. So here we have this place where this man can now see. Now I want you to watch the aftermath amongst the church once he can see. Starting in verse 8. Therefore the neighbors... And those who previously saw this man as a beggar, they were saying, is this not the one that used to sit and beg? And others were saying, it's he. But still others were saying, no, but, it's, but he is like him. No, this guy that's seeing, I think is somebody else that just happens to look like the guy who used to be blind because the guy who used to be blind can't not be blind. He was born blind. And so now there's someone else who looked like, and look at the response of the blind guy. He kept saying, that means more than once. He kept saying, I'm he, it's me. I'm actually the guy. I was the one sitting here. Hey, guess what? I can see. It's like, don't, don't, don't fool me around with somebody else. I'm actually the guy who couldn't see. So they were saying to him, to the blind man, how then were your eyes opened? And he answered, the man who is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went away and washed and I received my sight. And they said to him, where is he? And he said, I don't know. This is actually a funny statement when you figure out what's actually, why he is saying that. He meets this guy while he's blind who puts mud in his eyes and then sends him away. He's never seen Jesus. He said, I don't know. There was a guy named Jesus. I heard him spit. And then all of a sudden he put mud on my eyes and he told me to go to the pool and now I can see, but I don't know who he is. I could be standing in front of him and not know who it was. 
This is the point for me where the first missed revival happens in this story. Do you notice there's no rejoicing? Nobody is saying, this is the most awesome thing ever. I've known you all my life. You've been sitting by the gate. You've been begging. You've been blind. And now you see this is great. Let's rejoice. We don't care how it happened. It's just a... Nobody does. They say, how did this happen? Let's, let's question this. Let's figure out what went on. So in 13, they brought to the Pharisees the man who was formerly blind. Now it was on the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also were asking him, how did you receive your sight? And he said to them, he applied clay to my eyes. I washed and now I see. Don't you like the fact that his story is getting shorter? Hear me out. It's not that complicated. Spit, clay, wash, see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees were saying to him, this, is, this man, Jesus, is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Boom. Boom. Have you ever heard a believer doubt a miracle by using scripture. Well, I don't think the Bible says that miracles can happen anymore. Can you imagine arguing whether or not miracles happen with a guy who's standing in front of you who is blind this morning and can see now? This is what they're doing. And they're saying, well, it couldn't be of God because he did it on the Sabbath. Their first response is to contend for why it could not happen instead of being excited that it could happen, immediately arguing that scripture does not allow it to happen this way. And they missed the revival of the moment by using scripture to doubt the miraculous work of Christ. But others were saying, how can a man who is a sinner, as in how can Jesus, if he's a sinner, perform such a sign? And there was a division among them. And they said to the blind man again, what do you say about him? Since he opened your eyes, and the blind man says, he's a prophet. Isn't it awesome that they're looking at the guy who got healed and saying, do you think he's of God? What do you think a healed blind man is going to say if he can now see and he couldn't this morning about whether or not it was from God. I, I think he's saying, what is wrong with you people? I was blind this morning. Now I can see. And I don't think the devil does nice things like that. 18, the Jews did not believe it of him that he had been blind and received his sight. Here we go. You got healed? Well, I don't think you actually got healed. I don't think you were ever blind. I don't think you ever actually had diabetes. Can I really believe that you got healed? Until they called the parents of the very one who had received his sight, and they questioned them saying, is this your son? who you say was born blind, how then does he now see? Do you see what I was talking about earlier when it comes to diabetes? Let's find a way to confirm whether he actually had diabetes. We're going to call his parents to see if his parents can confirm for us that he was actually blind and that he was born blind. It's like calling in the doctor's report. Can you confirm his blindness? Because maybe he never really was because their first reaction is to doubt. His parents answered and said, we know that this is our son. Good job. Good job. Do you think they, like the other people, had to walk around him and say, well, I think he looks like my son, but he could be my son, but I'm not. No, they say, yeah, he's my son, and he was born blind, but how he sees, watch this, we do not know, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. And this is the weirdest statement. Ask him, he's of age, He'll speak for himself. Anyone think that's an odd response to say? Ask my son, he's of age. He can answer for himself about how that's, why did they say that? Look on in verse 22. His parents said this 
because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed, if anyone confessed him, Jesus, to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. For this reason, his parents said, he's of age, ask him. Listen to me. That was the next missed revival opportunity. Because the parents could have shouted from the mountaintops that our son sees, that he got healed, that a miraculous thing had happened. They could go out and tell the whole city, this guy named Jesus came into town and our son born blind is now seeing. But guess what? They were afraid. Are we afraid that other people might actually think we believe in miracles? Are we timid about that? Are we timid to say, well, yeah, I think a miracle actually happened there. Just in case it's not legit, we don't want people to believe that we fell for it. Listen to me, I want you to ask yourself, which is better? That you got fooled or that you did not rejoice in a miracle that Jesus did? Which is better? That you didn't get fooled or you didn't rejoice in a miracle that Jesus did? So a second time, They called the man who had been blind and they said to him, give glory to God because we know this man, Jesus, is a sinner. Here's what's happening. We don't like Jesus, so tell us it was not him who healed you because anyone we don't agree with cannot do the things of God. Oh, that crazy charismatic church. They don't know the Bible. People may be getting healed over there, but I doubt they're really getting healed. I actually love the fact that we have to bring up the question of did people actually get healed because it forces people into scripture to find out if healing is available or not. 25, he then answered, look, look, whether he's a sinner, I don't know, but let me tell you what I do know. I do know that I was blind and now I see. Do you see how short the story got? Let's cut this thing to the quick. I think I've told this story three times now. Blind, see. Blind, see. Not complicated. I don't know who Jesus is. I don't know whether he's a believer or not. I, I just know I, it's like the classic body slam on the wealth of the day, on the, on, the, on the religious leaders. He just says, look, you guys can argue this all day about who this guy is, but here's the bottom line. Couldn't see this morning, can see now. 26, so they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open? Has he not explained this like three times already? Spit, clay, wash, see. How did he do this? Why? Because what they're doing is saying, let's question the process to see if Jesus did anything we can disapprove of. What scripture did he use? Did he say in Jesus' name, You think Jesus ever said, in my name, (laughs) did he cast a demon out of you? Had he been to a doctor recently so that the doctor put some salve on your eyes and what Jesus did was just a follow-up to the healing that you already had? And he answered them and he says, I told you already and you are not listening. Why do you want to hear this story again? Listen, listen. Healed people do not want to be questioned about their healing. They want to hear you rejoice in their healing, not question whether or not it's valid. Uh, Has someone ever given you a gift? They give you this nice present. It's just a gift they're going to give to you. Here, I I want you to have this. How many of us would turn back to them and say, how much did you pay for it? Doesn't that somehow kind of take the heart out of the whole thing? I got healed and you want me to explain what my medical records were before, if the doctor saw it, what my medical records are now. I got, listen, I just want you to rejoice that I got healed. Mm. Read on. He says, you do not want to become his disciples too, do you? I love that. I mean, that's a straight up sarcastic slam. That is a, oh, since you're asking so many questions, maybe you actually want to know about this Jesus guy. And you can tell it hit that way because look at their response in 28. They reviled him. 
They reviled him and said, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he is from. What are they doing? Now they're doubting Jesus' credentials. The Pharisees are saying, we don't know him. He's not in the Moses club. He would think like us if he were of God. And by the way, we did completely overlook him in the Old Testament, and he's here now, but we didn't see that. You see, our club doesn't believe in the miraculous from anyone but us. Even though a blind man is standing right in front of us who was blind this morning and can now see, we don't believe in miracles. 30, the man answered and said to him, (laughs) well, here's an amazing thing. I think this guy is now just in laugh mode, okay? I think the the guy that can see now is just like, I'm kind of fed up with this whole process. Here's the amazing thing. You do not know where he is from, this Jesus, yet he opened my eyes. Now watch this. We know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, then God hears him. So here comes his great legal rebuttal. He's saying, okay, you don't know him. We know miracles come from God. We know sinners can't do miracles. He did a miracle, so he must be of God. That would be the logical conclusion, right? Because since the beginning of time, it's never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. This is a big deal that he was born blind. No one's ever opened the eyes of a person born blind. So if this man were not from God, he could do nothing about my blindness. It's like, let me put a cherry on top of my argument. He must be from God because no one born blind has ever been healed and he just healed me. And they answered him, I love this. You were born entirely in sin and you're teaching us. So they put him out. Missed revival. Here comes the greatest crusher of revival in this story. We don't understand what happened So we'll uh, reject the obvious truth that's in front of us. It doesn't happen in my church. It can't be of God. I cannot explain it with my beliefs. So what I will do is reject you. If I can't explain it, go away. That's what the Pharisees are doing. They're saying it doesn't fit within my understanding, so it can't be something that's real. So you just go away so I don't have to face this issue anymore. And the greatest revival that could have broken out at that moment just got crushed by a bunch of religious people because they refused to understand what happened right in front of them. What do you think Jesus feels like when he performs a miracle and people doubt him. What do you think he thinks of us questioning whether or not the miraculous was real? 35, Jesus heard that they had put him out and finding him, he said, do you believe in the son of man? And he answered, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Here's where you realize the blind man still doesn't know who Jesus is. Who did this? Tell me who did this. Where is the son of man so that I can believe in him? See, Jesus put mud in his eyes and sent him away and he's never seen him. But listen, write this down. When you are ridiculed and rejected and hurt by the false church, Jesus will always come and find you. Jesus will always come and find you. And he said to them, him, you have both seen the son of man and he is the one who is talking with you right now. Isn't that interesting? See, in the morning, all the blind man knew was the voice. In the evening, he could see, but the way Jesus confirms who he is is by saying, listen, He's the one talking to you now. In other words, if you would listen to my voice, you would know it was me who put that mud in your eyes. And the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. 
Now I'm going to rock your theological boat. The man who got healed had no faith in Jesus. The man who got healed did not believe in the Son of Man. The man who got healed didn't even know who Jesus was. The man who got healed had mud put in his eyes and got it washed out. But listen, when the man found out who healed him, he believed. Christians, lost people can be healed miraculously. Because that healing is accomplished to bring them to faith. Man, that should excite you about praying for a coworker. You don't have to lead them to Christ first. Get their pain healed first and they'll believe in Christ because of the miraculous thing that just happened. And by the way, when they say, my back doesn't hurt anymore, don't say, well, did you have a doctor's reason for why your back hurt? And should we go to your doctor to confirm that reason's no longer there? Man, just praise it. Rejoice with it. Say, it's amazing. Let me tell you how that happened. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. He heals. And Jesus said to him, Jesus said, for judgment, I came into this world so that those who do not see may see, that's the blind man, and those who see may become blind. I'm going to show you that's the Pharisees. Those of the Pharisees who were with him heard the things and said to him, we are not blind too, are we? It's like a glimmer of hope, isn't it? It's like a glimmer of hope that the Pharisees might be figuring something out. Are you saying we're blind? And Jesus said, if you were blind... You would have no sin, but since you say we see, your sin remains. What is he saying? If you believed in me, I would have removed your sin so you could see. But since you think you see and you don't believe in me, your sin remains on you. That's what he's saying. You're blind because you didn't believe. Had you believed, I would have taken your blindness away and you've been able to see the spiritual realm. You'd be able to see the kingdom of God. You'd be able to see and understand healing. Your sins would have been removed. You'd have been adopted by God as a child of God. You'd have moved in the things of the spirit. You'd have joined me in this work I'm doing. But since you couldn't believe in me, you stay in your sinful state. See, in this story, we heard the following skepticisms. I doubt it because I don't think it's scriptural. I'm looking for the healed person to give me a way out. I wonder if they were really ever blind. I doubt those who confirm the illness. I reject anyone who disagrees with me. I am going to ask again, did it really happen? I'm going to say it didn't happen the way it did. I'm going to doubt by reviewing what really happened to make sure there are no loopholes I can use to not believe. I'm going to doubt the healer's credentials. And we don't have any answers to this healing, so we want you to go away. We're right, aren't we? Sad. And so I'm asking the Holy Spirit. I don't think... Revived Church really doubts healing. Because on Wednesday night, before you even gave me this message, I asked who had been healed and all these people raised their hand and they were good with it. And then when I asked them to give testimonies, people shouted and they said, this is great, this is awesome. But then the Holy Spirit said, you're going to need this lesson. This congregation is going to need this lesson. Now, I don't know about you, but that ripping excites me. Because what he is saying is, you're about to see healing in the miraculous like you never have. Don't doubt it. Don't doubt it. Don't doubt it. 
Don't question it. Rejoice with it. I'm about to break out in healing in your midst. I declare in this house that people are going to get set free, that bondages are going to be broken, that people are going to get healed. Stand to your feet, please. I want you to shout it out for a healing Jesus. I want you to lift it up in his name. I want my prayer ministers down here quickly, please. I need all my prayer ministers down here quickly. Because this is what I'm saying today. I declare that healings and miracles are going to break out in this church. And I declare that we will rejoice in those healings and miracles so that we are not a hindrance to the revival that's coming our way. Raise your hands. Raise your hands. Father God, we believe. We believe in the miracle working power of Jesus. We believe that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us. Therefore, we can impart healing. Therefore, the miraculous can happen in this house. And therefore, we will not doubt. We will not doubt. We will rejoice in the healings that happen. And Lord God, I'll say this in front of you. If I rejoice and someone was fooling me that didn't really get healed, I don't care because I'm going to give you the glory because the next guy will get healed and it'll be a legitimate rejoicing. And I'll be the fool for you, Jesus. I'll be the fool for you because I believe in your healing. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thank you for joining us today. I hope the word today has been impactful. I hope it's been meaningful. I hope there was something said today that struck you in your spirit that you could ask the Holy Spirit to give you revelation of how you can use that in your life today. We thank you so much for joining us. We'd love to have you join us in the actual services at 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. on Sunday morning at 851 Johnson Avenue in Stewart, Florida. And if you'd like more information about Revive Church, check out our website. It's reviveusnow.com. God bless. Have a great day.